just want to spend a minute on some of the history because it's fascinating, but it also kind of gets you to kind of where we are today in, in terms of how we um, are in, our, in this current state. So some of the earliest um, endoscopic attempts or tr treatment attempts for hydrocephalus are over 100 years old. You can see um, the first uh, real kind of one of the first reported attempts was in 1910 where the, uh, Victor Darwin Lespinaz essentially full graded the choroid plexus with an endoscope in a child. Um, Dandy did the same thing. His first uh, four cases, three of the kids died almost immediately after surgery, but he went back and did the fourth case and the child survived long term. So he used the nasal speculum. You can see there in this drawing, made a couple of burr holes and essentially pulled the choroid plexus out of the child's brain. And, you know, even when we um, inadvertently make, uh, make contact with the choroid plexus, sometimes it can be um, fun to stop some of the bleeding. And you can imagine what that must have been like at that in that day and age. The first endoscopic third ventriculopsy was performed by Mixter using an assistoscope um, and kind of with transmitted light down from a um, from an external source and put in a report of like nine or ten cases of choroid plexus cauterization in, in 1934 and then about 10 years later he reported another 20 or so cases so there were clearly attempts to treat hydrocephalus endoscopically um, very early in the last century. But all this changed around 1950 when Nelson and Spitz at CHOP kind of introduced the concept of the modern shunt and, and, and essentially they developed a valve. It was like a spring ball type of valve that worked well. It was typically introduced into the heart, into the right atrium, but it had a lot of problems. The perineal, the catheters, the silastic materials were not really up to the task and it was difficult to keep them open. But that eventually improved and then a big step was the, the Holter um, valve. When John Holter, whose son actually had hydrocephalus from a model of meningocele and actually passed away from a shunt when he had a shunt malfunction, um, he developed, he was a machinist and developed a one way valve that was attached to the valve that Nelson and Spitz developed. And if, essentially that changed everything. And, and the, the, the effectiveness of uh, shunts really improved a lot. And with the newer technology, surgeons were able to place them into the peritoneum with much lower complication rates and, and the surgery itself was technically easier. So that's really when the enthusiasm for endoscopic procedures started to wane. So I want to concentrate today on three areas um, of, of treatment. First, very briefly, is the treatment of the, some of the smallest infants that we care for, those with post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus of prematurity. Just a few slides on that. Most of the talk is going to be on endoscopic third ventriculosity with a few examples of cases. Um, the, indications, the preparation of the patient, the procedure, and then some pearls and pitfalls. And the same for shunting procedures for hydrocephalus, primarily though concentrate just on the ventricular peritoneal shunt, which is the, by far and away the most common of all of these. So we know that um, um, germinal matrix hemorrhage is an important um, problem for pediatric neurosurgeons. Fortunately, the incidence seems to be decreasing with better pulmonary care, um, better uh, uh, critical care of these very fragile infants, but about 30 to 50 percent of children with germ severe germinal matrix hemorrhage will develop a ventricular enlargement, and some of those will go on to develop post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus that requires diversion. The problem is when this happens, they're oftentimes very small. They can be 7, 800, 900 grams, way too small for to accept a ventricular peritoneal shunt. So in many of those cases, temporary measures might be required, required in, in the smallest of these infants. Um, so the timing and, and when to intervene and, and how we intervene remains controversial. There's a wide range of practice patterns that the, the guidelines are, are really not uh, very clear on this. And, and the determination to treat is really based on the clinical signs of the infant. If they're uh, symptomatic, sometimes they may uh, exhibit bradycardia or apnea. Um, they can have progressive ventricular enlargement and then other signs of raised intracranial pressure. So Usually that's when the surgeon may, may deem it necessary to intervene. And again, there's some temporary measures, but really none of these are recommended in this day and age. So Diamox was used in the past, but really not recommended at this point. Um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Frequent lumbar punctures, again, was used in the past, but it's, they, they can be very problematic and very ineffective is the bottom line. So they're really very rarely, if ever used. A direct ventricular puncture sometimes can be used to sample CSF if there's no way to get CSF in the other liner, but, but the problem with that is it leaves, leaves a mark. It can leave a significant tract for encephaly. So that's really been abandoned for, for um, routine use. And, and an external ventricular drain in a very small infant like this can also be very problematic in terms of um, 
just managing that because of keeping it keeping track of how much uh, uh, CSF is draining and also the high risk of infection. So most of these temporary measures have been abandoned on this left side of the slide. What it comes down to really are a few other options. And one of those is a ventricular access device. And you can see there's an actual image of one there with a coin. So they're very tiny devices. Essentially, it's like a, a reservoir and catheter joint. There's different variations of that. Different manufacturers have different versions of that with different sizes. But essentially, it's placed into the ventricle and the subcutaneous reservoir is there. And it can be accessed periodically as needed for control of the ventricular megaly. And Using the best of cases, the ventricles stabilize. It's rare to see them get much smaller. Um, you can only tap these so many, so many or so often. Um, any more than it, once or twice a day can be really difficult or problematic on the skin. But at least stabilize things until the point where the child may become uh, of sufficient size to accept a shunt if that's deemed necessary. And another option is, is a subgaleal shunt or a ventricular subgaleal shunt. And this is a picture from a colleague, but. Essentially, it's a, the same type of device, but it's kind of left open on the side or the bottom, and the device is placed into the ventricle, but a large subgaleal pocket is created. This is a piece of like silastic attached to it with a few sutures to keep the galea or the scalp from, from um, contacting and then adhering to the underlying soft tissues and closing off that space. So the fluid, as you can see, collects underneath the scalp and it can be unsightly, but, but essentially it's kind of a more continuous drainage of the, of the CSF into the subgaleal space and it's absorbed that way as opposed to having to tap the shunt or tap the reservoir on a daily basis. So just um, another, another option for, for young infants. Um, eventually the decision needs to be made if the child, will have, the device will need to be converted to a ventricular peritoneal shunt or some other uh, surgical, more definitive surgical treatment. So that's really all I wanted to say on some of these very young infants that may require surgery. You'll, you'll probably see these on a rotation from time to time, depending on um, which service you're rotating on as a student. So I want to shift gears now to some endoscopic procedures, really the endoscopic third ventriculosity and its role in pediatric hydrocephalus. So this is a is a really a, a, a great way um, to deal with with non-communicating hydrocephalus. And as we see, as we'll see, the indications are beginning to expand more into some of the communicating types of hydrocephalus. But essentially, the procedure itself creates a new pathway between the ventricular compartment and the subarachnoid space. And you can see here, typically, uh, the CSF is generated in the lateral and third ventricle, and even in the fourth ventricle, but the majority is up above in the lateral and third ventricles. And it flows down through the cerebral aqueduct and eventually exits into the subarachnoid spaces through the the phenomena of uh, Majandi and, and Lushka in the posterior fossa. And you can see the CSF is in the subarachnoid space making its way up towards the vertex where it'll eventually be reabsorbed. The key here is that in somebody who has a blockage either at the, at the level of the uh, midbrain, posterior third ventricle, fourth ventricle, or the fourth ventricular outflow foramina, the CSF can't get out into the subarachnoid space. So the CSF, this is a very simple concept, um, is allowed to escape through a an opening through the floor of the third ventricle. So a third ventricle, third ventricle ostomy, third ventricular ostomy. So we make a small fenestration or ostomy in the in the bottom of the in the floor of the third ventricle. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.